Uh, strangely enough, my education about the mind of a baby didn't come in school. Um, I didn't learn anything about that, even in the PhD program. And I was 16 years into my career, doing the best I could in therapy, when I decided to take a course in clinical applications of hypnosis. Um, it, it was an immersion experience for me in the infant mind because now I had a tool to explore memory. And I was taught uh, to invite people to go back to whenever they first felt this way that they were uh, coming to see me for. Uh, I didn't know that people could remember birth. So I just said, go back to when you first felt this way. <laughs> and they would go places like birth or into the womb. And this was a total revelation to me. I had to, in fact, forget everything that I thought I knew about the mind of a baby, um, which I'd come to understand um, falsely in retrospect from uh, science. <laughs> it, it was an awkward position, but inspiring. Because what I found out was that infants had amazing memory, and in terms of science, there was no way to explain it. Uh, neuroscience made no room for prenatal memory. <laughs> uh, the brain wasn't nearly complete enough, and it wasn't hooked up properly so that uh, the expectation in both psychology and medicine in 1974 when I took this course was that, of course, babies couldn't remember anything. They didn't have the mind for it. And a lot of things followed from that basic uh, belief that the baby couldn't interpret, since it didn't have enough brain, uh, what it was feeling. It would not even know its own mother at birth. She would just be another object in the room. <laughs> and it meant that pain was not a consideration in medicine because that would require a certain amount of brain matter. And since the baby didn't have it, they couldn't have the pain. Uh, th this led to strange behaviors on the part of obstetricians and neonatologists and pediatricians. This is the medical group that deals with babies. Uh, they weren't thinking that anybody was there that they had to worry about. Uh, because of this basic belief in science and psychology that there wasn't enough brain power for babies to have any authentic emotion, or much of any sensation, and no sense of pain. They were unrestrained in what they could do for the baby uh, to save its life and so on. So what they turned out doing was in direct conflict with the actual baby. And um, they managed uh, to stick with that belief through decades and are still not completely free from it. For example, uh, babies uh, under obstetrical uh, rules were always born into a cold room. Uh, this, this just overlooks the fact, it blinds itself to the fact that babies have a very keen sense of temperature when they're born. <laughs> And uh, they complain about being either too cold or too hot. Uh, they like it in between, like most of the rest of the human race. The temperature was, was the first and most obvious thing about all these obstetrical births, is that they were cold. There was brief relief from that when they, Leboye got people to try some warm water or, or warm temperature water, but that uh, that reformation didn't last. 
it was thought to be unimportant. Uh, the, the other terrible abuse of medicine was to puncture a baby with needles. Now, uh, this is damn serious. <laughs> uh, they would jab the heels. It's called a heel stick. But the people who did that procedure knew they had to jab very deep and very hard or they wouldn't get enough blood for several tests. And if they didn't, they would have to do it over again. And they were very uncomfortable doing it. But it was the rule. Other injections took place too. Vitamin E had to be injected. Uh, in terms of physical comfort, babies were put in strange positions uh, when they were birthed from what they were used to. They were used to this nice curved environment uh, where there were no uh, corners and edges and sharp places. <clears throat> Nothing was straight in the womb. But to take a baby out by the heels and upside down was a spinal adjustment no baby would ask for. It was painful. Putting them on flat surfaces was inappropriate to the babies, but they, uh, in obstetrics they thought nothing of it. Uh, sometimes uh, babies were hit in the course of birth uh, because they weren't breathing. And that was the uh, boomeranging of the anesthetics that uh, they had been given. So they had to be resuscitated. Well, that whole awkward process wasn't very nice for the babies. They knew they were being hit, but they felt innocent and couldn't understand why they were being hurt. They're acting like they're being tortured. Their faces are grimaced and they're tense. They're very uncomfortable. But in spite of all the yelling and crying and screaming, which is absolutely typical of the American way of birth, <laughs> crying babies are everywhere. Uh, nobody was paying serious attention to this performance. It was the strongest kind of nonverbal message that a baby could come up with. And it was unrestrained. I mean, when you think of the power and the strength of babies complaining and crying and protesting at birth. It's very impressive. And some of them actually said to me, I'm, I'm protesting as strongly as I know. I'm crying as loud as I can, but nobody cares. Now, here we're back to the kind of the, the delusional thinking of the obstetricians who are imagining a different baby than the one who's right there. <laughs> uh, I think they're, they're hallucinating a baby more to their liking, uh, who submits to whatever they want to do without complaining. And they simply are applying what they thought they learned in anatomy and, and in neuroscience, that since the baby hasn't a proper mind, an adequate mind, it can't say anything. Its communications are non-communications. Uh, they just blotted it out as a human event because the brain was lacking. So they didn't expect to learn anything from babies. And they didn't expect babies to learn anything from them. So they didn't think the baby was having a real experience. So they overlooked all those things. And the marvel to me as an observer is that they did this for decades, decade after decade after decade in the 20th century. The whole half of the 20th century was like that and it's still happening today.